I love to talk about the acoustic modeling. I'll be glad to, uh, to answer any questions offline. But I actually, in, I condensed this from another talk, and I removed uh, some of what was already kind of superficial uh, information about the acoustic modeling. <coughs> kind of condense it. So I'm just going to talk at kind of a high level uh, about how we do this, and I, I hope I'm not talking down to anybody here, but I'm assuming that we have kind of a, a mixed group. Um, so let me give a little bit of a perspective then of how we put this stuff together. Um, the first big problem that we have um, is with getting the environmental information. Um, and a lot of people take this for granted. It's a huge problem. It's a problem that the U.S. Navy has. Uh, all the time as well. So if you think, well, somebody has it and we're just not getting it, the answer is no. Uh, we're always we're always short on this information. Um, and uh, let me back up for a second here and draw this analogy to uh, if you were uh, a lighting designer trying to figure out how you're going to illuminate a room like this. Obviously, you're going to think first about the overhead lighting, what kind of wattage of bulbs you're going to put in and where they're locating. So that's obviously your uh, analog to surface shipping, and so that's one of the key inputs. But the other key inputs are how reflective are the boundaries. Now, we're not usually worried about sidewalls in the ocean unless you're working in uh, ocean canyons or fjords, but we are very concerned about whether you have dark carpeting or light carpeting in terms of reflectivity to sound. So uh, that's going to be critical. The ocean surface is usually a pretty good reflector depending on frequency. It's kind of like an acoustic mirror, but as it gets churned up by waves and things like that, it starts to act like a broken mirror, and that's another consideration in the acoustic model. So with that little bit of uh, background here, uh, one other thing to mention that makes acoustic modeling really fun for, for us is that there's an extra layer of complexity in the ocean, which is that the ocean temperature varies significantly as a function of depth within the, within the ocean, and other things do as well, salinity, for instance, and pressure. Those things affect the way the waves travel. So in this room, uh, we're normally happy to think of uh, rays of light as being straight ray paths. In the ocean, over the distances that we're looking at, they bend a huge amount. Uh, you can think, for instance, uh, about waves at a beach. If you look closely at them, you'll see how they're affected, that they don't just break straight towards the towards the coast. They're affected by the, the top, top, topography or the bathymetry underneath, and the waves get bent around and so forth by feeling the drag on the bottom. Anyway, the same thing happens with the sound waves. In the deep ocean, they travel in huge uh, loops of uh, typically 60 kilometers in length and they cycle all the way down to the bottom, and they come back up to the top, and that's all because of those refractive effects. Okay, so that's a two-second course in acoustic propagation. So let me go through a little bit more uh, here. So obviously, somebody was talking about uh, the bathymetry, or you know, are those effects included? That's a critical thing you have to get in there. If you have, uh, for instance, sea mounts, those are going to cast acoustic shadows. And so you have to know the bottom depth. And, uh, so there is, at this point in time, we, we usually get pretty good information uh, about bottom depth, so that's usually not a big problem. But there's the global map showing, showing the water depth. Uh, the biggest problem that we and the U.S. Navy has, uh, if you look globally, is knowing you know, how reflective that bottom is, whether it's a light or dark carpeting, whether it's a, whether it's a silt or whether it's exposed granite. Those are very different acoustically in terms of their reflectivity. This was uh, Laurel's best attempt as, as a geophysicist to try and uh, combine this information from different databases. And you can see it's probably it's still kind of sketchy, but this is a depiction. Um, the color bar is grain size in terms of feet units, which anyway, it's just a particular way of, of again, characterizing the grain size. So that's, that's our environmental information about the reflectivity of the bottom. Um, in terms of sound propagation in the ocean, you might not think about this, but it's not just reflecting off of the water bottom interface, but especially at lower frequencies, say 50 hertz or so, it actually gets into the bottom and it propagates quite effectively. Uh, if it's basalt, it will go through it with very little attenuation and come back out through the ocean bottom later and continue to propagate uh, within the ocean channel. So you have to actually know quite a bit about that as well. Uh, and so Laurel put together, I uh, forgot how this is a database from NOAA, uh, information about sediment thickness throughout the world. And that's, so that propagation is, is, that part of the propagation physics is included. Um, 
I just skipped one here really by accident, but uh, the other thing, the other ingredient is to understand essentially the weather forecast for the ocean in terms of its temperature structure. So how warm is the ocean as a function of latitude uh, and how warm is it as a function of depth? Those are critical things and we tap into the World Ocean Atlas, uh, which is what's called the climatology, but it gives you historical information about the uh, ocean temperature. Today, it's amazing actually what you can get off the web. You can go to, for instance, the uh, HICOM site and get a weather forecast for the ocean for any part of the world with pretty good resolution. So we could today go off and say, you know, what's, what's the ocean temperature like off of, say, Korea or something, and you can just pull that right off of the web and put it into your uh, acoustic model. But for, for here, we're just using uh, the climatology. Okay, I jumped ahead here. Okay, uh, so we were talking about how the other key thing is the input in terms of the wattage, you could say, uh, the amount of illumination or insonification of the ocean due to all the shipping that uh, uh, Terry was talking about and Megan also. Um, I'll just go off on a couple small tangents here to say that um, there's a lot that's not known about how loud ships are. First of all, they're not just isotropic light bulbs, they have a directional pattern to them, and that's not very well known. Um, uh, ship traffic, as a number of people have mentioned, has been increasing, uh, and I'm not an expert about this, but the types of propulsion systems used in ships have been changing quite a bit. And so the noise level of a ship today is not necessarily the same as one 20 years ago, even if they were the same way. So there's a lot that is still not known about that in measurements like the, one that, uh, the ones that Megan were talking about where they put out the, the HARP systems uh, to try and characterize that. That's an important area that uh, we'll need to look at. Now, what we like to do, regardless of the source type, whether it's ships or air guns, what we often like to do is try and convert them all to a source level density, which again is, is essentially a wattage per square meter, the amount of sound that's put in. And that's a good cross check, that's a good sanity check for us to make sure that we, when we're working with lots of different sound types, to make sure that we, uh, that they all make sense. So that's our, our first step in the acoustic modeling. And you see it here represented in a, a dB scale. So this is just a re-plotting of Kerry's shipping density, uh, bringing in the source levels and the number of ships per square kilometer to get that, uh, that illumination for it. And then uh, Kerry already showed the sort of plot that comes out. Uh, this is a global soundscape showing uh, with, as you go to the warmer, the redder colors, the higher levels of dB of sound intensity. I think these are the first uh, published uh, depictions of global soundscapes uh, that have been made, and this has all been done in just the last year or so. Um, and uh, so it, we're finding them really interesting to look at. Carrie showed on one of her plots that there are a lot of things that go into that. Uh, a lot of things that affect that, for instance, uh, in the, in the uh, North Atlantic, we saw the, uh, the fact that there were white areas around the Mid-Atlantic Bridge, which we assume is due to the stripping off of this deep cycling uh, acoustic energy as it, as it hits the, the bridge. Um, and that reminds me to say, uh, you might think that, that envisioning these soundscapes is all about just knowing where these ships are. I want to emphasize again that that's just half of the problem. So half of it is what's the insonification. The other half is what does the ocean do to it? How does it strip it off? Does it propagate it well or does it propagate badly? So here we're finally seeing uh, that whole picture. And uh, we're still learning quite a bit about that. I was talking to Laurel about there's this, uh, well, let's see, you can't see it here. Oh, well, I won't look at that. Anyway, you see in the, uh, between the United States and Asia, you see a lot there from ship traffic and ship traffic and also between Europe and the United States. There are some other areas around the world where there are high intensity that were a little bit surprising to us and because the ship traffic didn't see that high, seem to be that high. But we assume that that's associated with the fact that the bottom is probably a, a good reflector in those areas. Uh, for, um, I guess I didn't give this background, but Brandon briefly alluded to the fact that there was a large NOAA project that was looking at the EEZ. Uh, all of this was really motivated towards providing that background hum for what was happening within the U.S. Uh, EEZ. Uh, and 
as there's been a big database now that's been assembled, and I guess I'm being worried here, but I just wanted to explain that I'm showing results here at a particular frequency of 200 hertz and a particular depth, but for this project, we model a whole series of frequencies from, I forget, 10 hertz to a kilohertz, something like that, and we model a whole series of depths. So we have a characterization of the global soundscapes across the whole volume and across a whole bunch of frequencies. Um, so let's see. Anyway, to sort of wrap up that first part, I'd just like to say that we have this vision that uh, over the coming years that we'll be getting towards something that's like a noise equivalent of an ocean uh, weather forecast, so that you would be able to go to a website in a given month or a given day and get a picture like what I just showed you of what the local noise structure is that would take into account seismic exploration activity, that would take into account, for instance, weather, lightning strikes, and things like that, and get this uh, synoptic picture of things. Um, I'll wrap up with, with one um, sort of second example here. Uh, there were a lot of interesting things done as part of this NOAA effort to model uh, sound in the US EEZ. A lot of different types of sound sources, including uh, pile, pile driving for uh, a proposed wind farm, maybe sonar exercise, uh, and many other things. Uh, probably the most detailed modeling was done for the Gulf of Mexico, and I just want to give you a picture of what that sort of modeling was like. Again, we, uh, we have to assemble uh, all the environmental information. Notice on the bottom there, those are two different uh, databases of sediment grain size. Uh, the one on the left is a Navy standard database, actually. Uh, the one on the right is an openly uh, available database. And I just want to mention there, you see the, that there are significant differences there in grain size, and that just points to the difficulty of getting that environmental information. Anyway, so we worked in much greater detail in the Gulf of Mexico uh, with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Terry and a few other people. We got a bunch of different layers for different types of shipping traffic. Uh, uh, the global stuff as well as cruise ships and roll on roll off ferries. And uh, we also did an estimate of, uh, of traffic due to rig surfacing, rig surfacing uh, vessels. And the estimate was that there were probably something like uh, 100,000 uh, uh, ship uh, uh, tracks <laughs> in the course of a year. They're indi indicated on the uh, upper left there. Uh, so there's a huge amount of traffic going out to support these rigs out there, and uh, we convert that to the lower right is a, a picture of the density of those vessels. Anyway, I really just wanted to give you a high-level picture. Uh, not, it's not so much the results here that are important, but just I think the process that we're trying to get to where we can look at the, uh, the contribution of each of these different layers to the overall soundscape and try and offer the regulator the chance to, to hopefully regulate what's important and understand which, which layers are most important in terms of what marine mammals are exposed to. So we can now look at all of these layers. Uh, look at, you see global shipping, the rig servicing vessels, uh, air gun surveys, uh, and we can look at their sum and, and see how they contribute. So, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to break here. Yeah, anyway, so I'm just going to stop right there. I guess I didn't get any questions while I was speaking, but I'll be glad to answer any if there are. Uh, actually, we did do some modeling up in, uh, in the Arctic. Um, were you, were you thinking about the global shipping? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm also thinking about the fact that the you know, ice cap is going away much, much faster than anyone ever thought. And uh -huh. within a decade or two, it's going to be yeah. a little faster. Yeah, and there'll presumably be more shipping traffic up there as well. I can't remember. I think we didn't have, did we have some or none uh, in terms of shipping traffic up in the Arctic? I forgot, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, we didn't do we didn't do a, a huge effort up in that area. Um, uh, there are specialized modeling techniques that are usually used for under ice propagation and so forth. So, yeah. Once you get the geomorphological data, mm -hmm. um, can you consider that invariant for significant periods of time? I mean, you don't have to do it again every 
10 years or something? No. Yeah, I mean, we normally consider that a variant. Um, there are special circumstances where there can be some time dependence. If people have suggested that the, the oceanography might have an effect on the temperature and so forth, but generally we would consider that a variant. The problem, though, is that you know, people will never have that measured <laughs> adequately. Um, is there another question? Uh, yes. We're using uh, Hamilton's equations to convert the sediment type and depth to phosphate profiles, or uh, it was something like that. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, probably. Yes. Are are all the models needed to model in that all um, frequency and depth settings? You have to run for different frequencies and different depths. Oh. Uh, can you combine? Yeah. What do you mean when you combine depths? Yeah, we're actually solving it for each different depth, and um, I'm sort of hesitating because we actually use uh, four different model types, but the main one that you're seeing here is a normal mode calculation, and then it's rerun for each frequency. Um, and I meant to mention that, um, I guess I didn't say this very well, but the process that we use for that is we, we create a grid of virtual sources. So if, you had, if we were talking about this room, you can imagine us putting in hypothetical lights at every position in the room. And then we can go in and then say, well, what's the actual position of lights? And you know, we could consider moving shipping lanes and things like that. And then uh, excite each of those virtual light sources according to the distribution that we see. So we're doing a huge number of calculations. It's actually one virtual source every degree around the surface of the globe, and it's every frequency. Uh, the normal mode method gives you all depths uh, essentially for free uh, in that construction. Uh, and then we do, uh, from every source, we do a bearing every 10 degrees. So I'm forgetting the number, but it's probably something like a million uh, propagation slices. So you have information for each depth layer? Just yes. I'm sorry? You're just choosing one of those depths when you're running the model. We choose the whole set, and I'm just showing you one slice. Okay. Yeah. What's your uh, depth slice for your propagation model? Um, we, uh, as part of the USF team effort, we sort of uh, converged on uh, an expanding grid. It was something like 10 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters, 400 meters, 800 meters, something like that. So it was, just, it was expanding as we went down in depth. 